Chapter Twenty Two of the Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twenty Two Sherburne Attending the Circus Intoxication in the Ring The Thrilling Tragedy. They swarmed up towards Sherburne's house, a whooping and raging like engines, and everything had to clear the way or get run over and trampled to mush, and it was awful to see. Children was heeling it ahead of the mob, screaming and trying to get out of the way, and every window along the road was full of women's heads, and there was nigger boys in every tree, and bucks and winches looking over every fence. And as soon as the mob would get nearly to them, they would break and skedaddle back out of reach. Lots of the women and children was crying and taken on, scared most to death. They swarmed up in front of Sherburne's palings as thick as they could jam together, and you couldn't hear yourself think for the noise. It was a little twenty-foot yard. Some sung out, "'Tear down the fence! Tear down the fence!' Then there was a racket of ripping and tearing and smashing, and down she goes, and the front wall of the crowd begins to roll in like a wave. Just then Sherburne steps out onto the roof of his little front porch with a double-barreled gun in his hand and takes his stand, perfectly calm and deliberate, not saying a word. The racket stopped and the wave sucked back. Sherburne never said a word, just stood there looking down. The stillness was awful creepy and uncomfortable. Sherburne run his eye slow along the crowd, and wherever it struck the people tried a little to outgaze him, but they couldn't. They dropped their eyes and looked sneaky. Then, pretty soon, Sherburne sort of laughed. Not the pleasant kind, but the kind that makes you feel like when you're eating bread that's got sand in it. Then he says slow and scornful, The idea of you lynching anybody. It's amusing. The idea of you thinking you had pluck enough to lynch a man because you're brave enough to tar and feather poor friendless cast-out women that come along here. Did that make you think you had grit enough to lay your hands on a man? Why, a man's safe in the hands of ten thousand of your kind, as long as it's daytime and you're not behind him. Do I know you? I know you clear through. I was born and raised in the South, and I've lived in the North so I know the average all around. The average man's a coward. In the North he lets anybody walk over him that wants to and goes home and prays for a humble spirit to bear it. In the South one man all by himself has stopped a stage full of men in the daytime and robbed the lot. Your newspapers call you a brave people so much that you think you are braver than any other people. <laughs> whereas you're just as brave and no braver. Why don't your juries hang murderers? Because they're afraid the men's friends will shoot them in the back in the dark, and it's just what they would do. So they always acquit, and then a man goes in the night with a hundred masked cowards at his back and lynches the rascal. Your mistake is that you didn't bring a man with you. That's one mistake. And the other is that you didn't come in the dark and fetch your masks. You brought part of a man, Buck Harkness there, and if you hadn't had him to start you, you'd have taken it out in blowing. You didn't want to come. The average man don't like trouble and danger. You don't like trouble and danger. But if only half a man like Buck Harkness there shouts lynch him lynch him you're afraid to back down afraid you'll be found out to be what you are cowards and so you raise a yell and hang yourselves on to that half a man's coat tail and come raging up here swearing what big things you're going to do the pitifulest thing out is a mob 
That's what an army is, a mob. They don't fight with courage that's born in them, but with courage that's borrowed from their mass and from their officers. But a mob, without any man at the head of it, is beneath pitifulness. Now, the thing for you to do is to droop your tails and go home and crawl in a hole. If any real lynching's going to be done, it will be done in the dark, southern fashion, and when they come they'll bring their masks and fetch a man along. Now leave, and take your half a man with you, tossing his gun across his left arm and cocking it when he says this. The crowd washed back sudden and then broke all apart, and went tearing off every which way. And Buck Harkness, he heeled it after them, looking tolerable cheap. I could have stayed if I wanted to, but I didn't want to. I went to the circus and loafed around the back side till the watchman went by and then dived in under the tent. I had my twenty-dollar gold piece and some other money, but I reckoned I'd better save it, because there ain't no telling how soon you are going to need it away from home and among strangers that way. You can't be too careful. I ain't opposed to spending money on circuses when there ain't no other way, but there ain't no use in wasting it on them. It was a real bully circus. It was the splendidest sight that ever was when they all came riding in, two and two, a gentleman and a lady side by side, the men just in their drawers and undershirts and no shoes nor stirrups, and resting their hands on their thighs easy and comfortable. There must have been twenty of them, and every lady with a lovely complexion and perfectly beautiful and looking just like a gang of real sure enough queens, and dressed in clothes that cost millions of dollars, and just littered with diamonds. It was a powerful fine sight. I never see anything so lovely. And then, one by one, they got up and stood and went a-weaving around the ring, so gentle and wavy and graceful, the men looking ever so tall and airy and straight, with their heads bobbing and skimming along, away up there under the tent roof, and every lady's rose-leafy dress flapping soft and silky around her hips, and she looking like the most loveliest parasol. And then, faster and faster they went, all of them dancing, first one foot out in the air and then the other, the horses leaning more and more, and the ringmaster going round and round the center pole, cracking his whip and shouting, Hi! Hi! And the clown cracking jokes behind him. And by and by all hands dropped the reins, and every lady put her knuckles on her hips, and every gentleman folded his arms. And then how the horses did leap over and hump themselves. And so, one after another, they all skipped off into the ring, and made the sweetest bow I ever see, and then scampered out, and everybody clapped their hands and went just about wild. Well, all through the circus they done the most astonishing things, and all the time that clown carried on so it most killed the people. The ringmaster couldn't even say a word to him, but he was back at him quick as a wink with the funniest things a body ever said and how he ever could think of so many of them, and so sudden, and so pat, was what I couldn't no way understand. Why, I couldn't have thought of them in a year. And by and by a drunk man tried to get into the ring, said he wanted to ride, said he could ride as well as anybody that ever was. They argued and tried to keep him out, but he wouldn't listen, and the whole show came to a standstill. Then the people begun to holler at him and make fun of him, and that made him mad, and he begun to rip and tear. So that stirred up the people, and a lot of men begun to pile down off the benches and swarm towards the ring, saying, Knock him down, throw him out. And one or two women begun to scream. So then the ringmaster, he made a little speech and said he hoped there wouldn't be no disturbance, and if the man would promise he wouldn't make no more trouble, he would let him ride, if he thought he could stay on the horse. So everybody laughed and said all right, and the man got on. 
The minute he was on, the horse begun to rip and tear and jump and cavort around, with two circus men hanging on to his bridle trying to hold him, and the drunk man hanging on to his neck, and his heels flying in the air every jump, and the whole crowd of people standing up shouting and laughing till tears rolled down. And at last, sure enough, all the circus men could do, the horse broke loose, and away he went like the very nation, round and round the ring, with that sot laying down on him and hanging to his neck, with first one leg hanging most of the ground on one side, then t'other one on t'other side, and the people just crazy. It warn't funny to me, though. I was all of a tremble to see his danger. But pretty soon he struggled up a straddle and grabbed the bridle, uh, reeling this way and that, and the next minute he sprung up and dropped the bridle and stood, and the horse a-going like a house afire, too. He just stood up there, a-sailing round as easy and comfortable as if he weren't ever drunk in his life. Then he begun to pull off his clothes and sling them. He shed them so thick they kind of clogged up the air, and altogether he shed seventeen suits. And then, when he was slim and handsome and dressed the gaudiest and prettiest you ever saw, he lit into that horse with his whip and made him fairly hum, and finally skipped off and made his bow and danced off to the dressing room, and everybody just a-howling with pleasure and astonishment. Then the ringmaster, he see how he had been fooled, and he was the sickest ringmaster you ever see, I reckon. Why, it was one of his own men. He had got up that joke all out of his own head and never let on to nobody. Well, I felt sheepish enough to be took in so, but I wouldn't have been in that ringmaster's place not for a thousand dollars. I don't know, there may be bullier circuses than what that one was, but I never struck them yet. Anyways, it was plenty good enough for me, and wherever I run across it, it can have all my custom every time. Well, that night we had our show, but there weren't only twelve people there, just enough to pay expenses. And they laughed all the time, and that made the Duke mad. And everybody left, anyway, before the show was over, but one boy which was asleep. So the Duke said these Arkansas lunkheads couldn't come up to Shakespeare. What they wanted was low comedy, and maybe something rather worse than low comedy, he reckoned. He said he would size their style. So next morning he got some big sheets of wrapping paper and some black paint and drawed off some handbills and stuck them up all over the village. The bill said, At the courthouse for three nights only, the world-renowned tragedians David Garrick the Younger and Edmund Keen the Elder of the London and Continental Theatres, in their thrilling tragedy of the King's Camelopard, or the Royal Nonsuch, admission fifty cents. Then at the bottom was the biggest line of all, which said, Ladies and children not admitted. There, he says, <laughs> if that line don't fetch him, I don't know Arkansas. End of chapter 22